poor health, very much near death. In my nine year update, I put a chart of kind of my health progress and where I started from. And in that nine year update, I actually showed that the state of health goes from, I think, negative 25 to 100%. 10 years of vitamin A, the fact that you have done that is to some degree a debunking of the mainstream theory in and of itself. For me to make the recovery that I've made is, I think, pretty dramatic and completely unexpected. I, I did not at all expect this to happen. Do you think there is a possibility that some people are just more efficient and effective breaking down and eliminating vitamin A for some people the effects of it are significantly more toxic than other people. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, the diet that you ate to minimize your vitamin A, right, was mainly beef or bison, beans, I believe, black beans, and then is it some breads occasionally, but then you stopped. That's partly why I was interested in how much of your calories in the last 10 years have been coming from carbs as opposed to just from meat. So I'm gonna say, you know, probably 50% of my calories is from carbs. I've never been on the carnivore diet, and but now based on what I know, I think, oh, the carnivore diet might actually be better in the short term. For someone who is interested in the possibility of having the same complete rejuvenation of their, their health and well-being that you had, what would be kind of in your list of suggestions for them to do? Well. Hey, this is Elwin Robinson, creator of Genetic Insights, author of the Rejuvenate Blueprint. And in today's episode, we see the return of Grant Genereau. Grant Genereau is the um, author of various books, including Poisons for Profits. And uh, Grant Genereau is someone I'm a big fan of. He's someone who is an original thinker, who kind of questioned orthodoxy, someone who's uh, healed himself of you know, a very serious health problem and a lot of others. And he's someone who works you know, really tirelessly to uh, spread his message with you know, zero compensation for himself. So I judge him to be a man of integrity and a you know, very um, great person. And so this is part two. We already did uh, an episode of him before. And if you haven't watched that, I recommend that you do. We'll put the link in the show notes. But spoiler alert, if you haven't seen it, uh, in that episode, Grant talks about his theory, which is that uh, vitamin or vitamin A is not really a vitamin. It is actually uh, a poison. It's not necessarily going to hurt you if you have it once, but it's something that is a cumulative poison, which you know most poisons are in that they build up in the body. And in fact, because it is fat soluble, um, it is something that does build up in the body. And the more that there is of it, the more toxic it becomes and the more toxic the effect on the body can become. And so that was a very popular episode. We had a lot of people watch it. But out of all the episodes I've done, it's probably had the most people underneath saying that they would really love a debate with Grant and someone else. And... I said kind of repeatedly in the comments and my general policy was um, I'm totally up for that, facilitating that. It's never easy to coordinate people and to get them to agree to a debate because I guess innately it's a, a you know, kind of hostile thing or that's how people perceive it. Um, if and when I do debates on this show, which I would really love to, I will not make it hostile. I will make it very congenial. And in fact, maybe this episode is a bit of a panel for that, so I'll talk about that. So I said that anyone who I ever invited onto the debate grant, if he was even open to that, had to have been someone who had A, read his books, ideally, especially Poisons for Profits, I would say that's his main one, and second of all, had read them with an open mind. And if they had read Grant's book with an open mind and you know, still were sure that he was wrong or there was you know, some aspects of it that he was wrong about, then I would be happy to have them on, either just as a guest of mine or you know, maybe even to debate him. And honestly, this point now, I don't know how long it's been, nine months or something like that since he was last on the show, I haven't come across anyone who's met that criteria. I came across a couple of people who were kind of like trying to debunk him, but it was very obvious from that their perspective, like they didn't go into it with an open mind, they came into it like already wanting to disprove him. And so I wouldn't subject Grant to that. So I was like, you know what? I do understand everyone's kind of uh, desire, though, to see that conversation, that back and forth between someone who really believes in this position, the vitamin A is a poison, and someone who doesn't. So I was like, why don't I steel man that argument, steel man being a, I believe, a debating term, meaning where you 
you see the strongest version of the opposite perspective than what you had. So I thought, okay, let me listen. Let me gather what I think are the best arguments against Grant's theory and then maybe present them to him in obviously a you know, non-confrontational way and just you know, hear what he has to say. So you get a bit of that back and forth. So that was my goal with this episode. We didn't only talk about that. You know, the original reason I invited him on is because it's actually been 10 years that he's been doing this 100% uh, extremely low vitamin A diet. So we talked about that initially as well, but that's probably the, most, the, the, the bulk of the episode. Um, it's not a pure interview, even though I might refer to that in the actual recording. If I look back at it, it's probably more of a conversation. I think because I got into that mode of debate-ish-ing, I give my you know, opinion a few times more than if this were probably an actual interview. So uh, forgive me if you don't like that. That's uh, just what ended up happening. But I think despite that, I hope I have uh, addressed and fulfilled your desire to hear that kind of back and forth, to hear the to hear some good uh, counterpoints to the theory of, you know, vitamin A is a poison and for you to have that debate back and forth. So uh, I hope you enjoy it. Um, make sure you watch all the way through to the end. Hey, so uh, I'm thrilled today to be joined again by Grant Ginaru. Thank you so much for coming back, Grant. My pleasure. Thank you. Um, so the first episode with you, which I definitely recommend people watch, um, was very popular, um, you know, stirred up a lot of um, conversation. And I think it opened a lot of people to this uh, this theory, which you have uh, dedicated, you know, large portion of the last 10 years to. And in fact, it is just be uh it's been a 10 year anniversary, right? Of um, following through on the, um, some people question that it's impossible to have no vitamin A, but as low as possible vitamin A diet, right? Yeah, that's right. So I started August 11th, uh, 2014. So I passed the 10 year threshold. Uh, and yeah, virtually, you know, no vitamin A in my diet. You know, yes, there is like, you know, four I use per day, maybe. Um, <laughs> but I also do the plasma donations on a pretty frequent basis. So that offsets any of that, you know, uptake, uh, I believe. I could actually do the math on it, and prove that out. But um, yeah, 10 years. So here we are. That's very interesting. Uh, well, let's get straight into it. So I think the purpose of today's interview is, first of all, to, you know, talk a bit about your experience over the last 10 years. And then, um, you know, as this, theory has become more and more popular and it really has there are some people you know looking to argue with it or debunk it or whatever we might call so what i want to do is maybe bring up you know not the not the most crazy elements of that and i'm kind of bored of people just sharing the mainstream perspective as, as if it's a debunking it's like but but, but i want to share you know, maybe a few questions that have come up for me a few questions that clients have asked like honest you know, questions or um, challenges to the theory and then get your take on it, if that's okay. Sure. Yeah, you bet. Fantastic. All right. So um, first of all, uh, you know, 10 years of vit vitamin A, of course, the fact that you have done that um, is to some degree a, uh, what's the word, a debunking or a discrediting of the mainstream theory um, in and of itself, right? Because it, it, it shouldn't be possible for you to be as healthy as you are. So in fact, let's talk about that. Could, would you mind just for, you know, and I do recommend everyone watches the first interview before watching this, but just for those who maybe uh, to refresh their memory, what was your experience? What was your state of your health before you stopped pretty much all of the vitamin A and what is the state of your health now? Yeah, well, you know, way back then, it's it kind of 10 years ago, um, a little bit before that, actually, um, I was in a, in a state of uh, extremely poor health. Uh, and actually, in, in my nine-year update, I wrote, I put a chart of kind of, you know, uh, you know, kind of a sketch, really, of kind of my health progress and where I started from. And in that nine-year update, I actually showed that, that so I, the, the state of health goes from, I think, negative 25 to 100 percent, you know, good health. And um, probably in January of 2014, I actually showed the line dipping below the zero axis on, on the state of health. And I, I did that for a specific reason. I was curious if anyone would kind of catch that or notice that, but no, nobody has. Uh, but in my worst state of health, I was so near death, um, a little bit beyond that. Um, I don't want to talk about that. I'll get emotional. But um, so I was in extremely 
uh, poor health, very much near death. Um, some of the things, you know, I had, you know, of course I had failing kidneys. I was, um, you know, peeing blood routinely in the mornings. My skin was disintegrating. I was incredibly weak. Um, um you know, I, I could barely make it up a flight of stairs when it's all week. Um, you know, lots of, you know, cognitive issues, you know, just, you know, it was really near death. And so for me to make the recovery that I've made is I think pretty, um, pretty dramatic. And completely unexpected. I, I did not at all expect this to happen. I, I thought it was even myself when I first started that this is just crazy. This is you know, there's no way, but it actually turned out to be be accurate. And so, just to clarify, so did you have chronic kidney disease? Were you at the point of kidney failure uh, or almost kidney yeah, failure? Yeah, I, I had in 2006. I had been diagnosed with chronic kidney disease, and the prognosis was I had about four, or five years. Let's say five years remaining was the prediction. Um, it was, you know, the guy wasn't wrong. He was incredibly, you know, accurate by, you know, 2014 or 2013, you know, I was in serious, serious bad shape from the kidney, kidney disease, but just by pure coincidence, you know, my, one of my first interviews with the nephrologist, he revealed some information to me that just shocked me. And I decided I'm never going back. And I never did. You know, my wife, you know, was kind of begging me, oh, go back, go back, you know, and I, I just said, no, I'm not going back there. Um, so I was kind of let, letting nature take its course with the chronic kidney disease. And then kind of, you know, 2013, I had developed this body wide, you know, adult eczema. Uh, so, you know, clinically, you know, doctor diagnosed with two, you know, incurable, irreversible chronic, um, conditions, which I have reversed. And I have, you know, I jinxed myself and I was saying for sure, I've, you know, I've cool, cured myself from the eczema, the kidney disease. Yes. All indications are that I've fully recovered from that. But overall, my overall health has improved uh, dramatically, I guess. Uh, my joint health was incredibly bad back uh, back then. It was, you know, every morning it was just severe joint pain. Um, and crazy things were happening. Like my fingers were actually curling up at the ends of my fingers. <laughs> it's like, um, I guess, arthritis, right? It would be arthritis. And in the joints in my um, in my wrists were swollen and so, you know, clearly early signs of, you know, pretty serious arthritis, and that's reversed. Um, also, way, way back then, I don't know, probably over 20 years ago, I had been diagnosed with uh, scoliosis of the spine, like a, you know, a curve in my spine and a, and a bulging vertebrate in my spine, which I could easily see, you know, take my shirt off and look in the mirror, I could see this bulging vert vertebrate in my spine. Uh, that's reversed. So a lot of health conditions have, quote, reversed. You know, I'm still chronologically, you know, I'm 10 years older, but, um, you know, much, much better shape. And my strength and my endurance is pretty much, I'd say, the best it's been in my adult life. Um, yeah, for sure. You know, I'm you know, stronger today than I was in my 20s. Uh, um, and my endurance is is really good, like for cycling and stuff like that. I, I can, you know, I'm like an ever ready battery kind of thing. It's um, so well, overall really big improvement in my health, my vision. You know, so one of the one of the key claims of vitamin A is, um, well, you know, there's kind of multiple claims for vitamin A, but one of the key claims is it's you know, it's essential and necessary for vision, not only for the vision cycle, but for you know the health of the eyes. And if you don't have vitamin A, you will develop. You know, what's called xerophthalmia, the drying of the eyes and eventually the disintegration of, of the lens of the eye and the cornea. And, you know, you, you'll go blind without vitamin A. You know, then the prediction in the medical literature is, you know, relatively quickly. Um, no, it hasn't happened. My vision is, is excellent. My eye health is excellent. Um, so, yeah, I think I've completely debunked the theory that um, vitamin A is essential for human health. And um, Very interesting. I noticed one of the things you, uh, I think I read one of your updates, and one of the benefits you talked about was interesting. It's not something that people normally talk about, but you said that like um, you very rarely got too cold or overheated anymore. Yeah, it's, it's quite amazing. Uh, so, you know, 10 years ago, like here in Canada, we go skiing in the winter, and, uh, you know, one of my, you know, curses, I suppose, I was always sweating a little bit of this kind of background sweating, you know, all over my body kind of thing not nothing crazy but just a little bit you know um but if you get sweat in your boots in your in your winter ski boots that sweat just you know that moisture just sucks in the cold or and you know so by noon on a day of skiing i was done not because i was you know totally fatigued but it's like my feet are just getting freezing cold and uh now 
no problem at all. And uh, if I go out in the winter, I just, I, I don't know how to explain it, but I'm, you know, of course I dress properly in the winter, but, you know, kind of wearing the same kind of clothing that I would have worn, you know, a decade or two ago to go out into the winter weather, I would still be cold. Now today, if I dress properly, I'm not cold at all. And same with the summers. I just don't, uh, you know, I don't mind the heat at all. I don't mind the direct sunlight at all. If I go, you know, I typically try to do about 20K when I cycle. And, uh, now of course, there's the wind and stuff, so you're not sweating too much. The wind is actually taking a lot of the moisture away. But uh, compared to other people, I'm I'm bone dry after after 20 kilometers on my bike in, in the summer, right? It's like, um, so, yeah, that's, that's a big difference. Um, you know, back in my 30s, you know, I was wearing this kind of standard, you know, my standard uniform is a white T-shirt underneath the shirt. And, um, you know, 20 years ago, you know, after about six months of wearing one of these, you know, well, you know, of course, changing it every day. But, you know, within about six months, the shirt was done because the underarms would be yellowed and kind of, you know, like you cannot wash it out of the, out of the, out of the cotton shirt. So you throw out the shirt. Now today, there's no, there's no yellow staining. That's, uh, so yeah, that's, that's, you know, a whole bunch of surprises. Um, uh, but I, yeah, that's, that surprised me. I, of course, I had no expectation that anything like that would happen. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, yeah. Uh, the way I would explain it would be that, you know, there's an excellent um, balance and regulation of your thyroid and your adrenal glands because they're really the things that are, you know, regulating your temperature. And that is quite fine-tuning of health, you know. So uh, to me, that shows a relatively high level of health if someone's adrenal glands and thyroid are optimized that they can really adapt to very easily any environment. So, yeah, it's definitely a good sign. That's kind of why I picked up on it. Okay, interesting. This is fantastic. Oh, let's just talk about the lab test results um, as well. So, so did, when was the first time you actually tested, I guess, serum retinol is the only type of vitamin A that's, you know, easy to test, right? Yeah. So I got that test. I think I got the first one in 2018, the second one in 2019. 2018 and 2019 were both uh, 0 0.1 millimole per liter. And I just had another test here and it was 0 0.3 millimole per liter. So I don't know what to make of that. There are some explanations though. Uh, kind of, I did this, um, this niacin encounter, which may have resulted in that. I also did some reading. It sounds like, you know, there's one lab apparently in Canada that does the vitamin A test. So, you know, I'm in the Western provinces and when they take a sample, they send it out to Ontario to actually be processed in a lab. But I've read that some of the labs have switched to using ELISA tests rather than HPLC. So, there is some approximation also in the interpretation of that result. I don't know that for sure. I don't know exactly what they do. So I, I will try to get another test, um, you know, with an HPLC uh, process that will be much more accurate. So we'll see. There was also, uh, I know, Genova Diagnostics. I think that's available in Canada. They do not only retinol, but they can also measure beta carotene with them. That might be interesting at some point as well. Yeah, if you can, you know, I, I did check for online labs in Canada. I could not find a single one that did... Um, um vitamin a and i'd be curious we can talk about that maybe separately but um yeah sure check it out yeah yeah uh genova i mean they might be in the us you might have to ship it there but i think it's possible i know because i did it a few years ago i did um i, I did a both my beta carotene and my retinol was very high um when i tested them back in 2021 um okay so yeah very very interesting so you uh you didn't do a test before you started this experiment so we can't see you know the reduction but uh obviously it's so low that it would be classed as a severe deficiency by any normal mainstream yeah perspective yeah as a matter of fact when i got the results back from the lab on all three tests there's this warning you know you know your you know state of severe deficiency you know you know supplementation is recommended so yeah i'm technically been in a state of severe deficiency for you know at least six years now so here we are yeah <laughs> uh, yeah so that's very interesting and so that is your own lived experience that's irrefutable for you obviously and so um let, let's address some of the potential uh, objections which i've heard about this which you know perhaps makes some sense to me and i'd love to get your take on them so i think the i think the first thing is that you know the diet that you ate to minimize your vitamin a right was mainly uh, beef or bison uh Beans, I believe, black beans, and then is it some breads occasionally, but then you stopped? Is that... Yeah, so, yeah, for, for 
for most of the last 10 years, it's been rice. So currently, I'm, you know, I'm back on white rice. I did do that experiment with bread for eight or nine months, which turned out to be a bit of a disaster for me. Um, so, yeah, primarily, you know, those three foods. Um, so beans, rice, beef. Yeah. And, you know, some days I include apples. You well, know, quite a few days I include apples. I peel the apples. So, you know, it's uh, I'm still being, you know, extremely uh, diligent on, you know, having the most minimal vitamin A intake possible. Uh, so, you know. And do you track, like, uh, how much of your calories are coming from, you know, like fat versus protein versus carbs? I didn't. Uh, a year or two ago, I was using one of those uh, calculators on my on my phone. Um, I wasn't actually looking at the ratio of, of, of uh, proteins to carbs, et cetera. I was just kind of using to track my overall calories. And what I noticed was my calorie intake was, you know, it's, it's very low. It's like 1,500 calories per day kind of thing. And... Of course, I've noticed that in my food consumption. When I first started this, uh, my appetite was like, I don't know, appetite. My food consumption was about 2x of what it is today. So my overall calorie consumption on a daily basis is about one half of what I was taking in before. So I, I thought that's really interesting. It's like, you know, I, I just find that kind of fascinating. I was going to say, if you have plenty of energy and you're not feeling cold all the time, which obviously you said you're not, then... Um... You know, the natural conclusion I would come to first and foremost is probably that your uh, mitochondria become more efficient at creating energy or ATP from that food, right? Must be. And, you know, I'm not losing weight. I've been really steady on my weight for, geez, I don't know, quite a few years, like probably eight years now. My, my weight is, you know, within plus or minus two pounds. So I'm not losing weight, even though I've cut my calorie consumption in half, which is, you know, it's just what it is, right? It's like I... I find it interesting. So, all right, uh, I've got several points on this. Let me go to the, the first one that I was originally going to make. So a lot of people are saying, well, you're on like a, a very strict elimination diet where you are cutting out a lot of stuff. Um, could it be that the benefits you're receiving are from uh, cutting out something else rather than vitamin A? Sure. You know, there's, sure, there's always a possibility. Have you looked into that? Is there any other, you know, potential culprits that you're looking at as like, oh, this is possible? Well, um, I haven't really specifically looked at that. But, you know, my encounter with, with niacin, which I, I thought was also very fascinating. So when you reduce your diet down to three foods, like what I've done, and then you introduce a single other food and you can, you know, detect a reaction to it. It's like, I think that's, that's, you know, for me, it's like almost a scientific method, right? You change one variable at a time. And so when I, you know, when I tried to switch out the rice for, you know, I was using sourdough bread, uh, you know, I had this encounter with knives and I don't think I would have ever detected that if I was on a kind of, you know, much more varied diet. I know it took eight months. When you're saying encounter with niacin, do you mean that you also had supplemental niacin or just that there's more niacin in the bread than the rice? Just so what I had done is I switched out the rice. Again, I was concerned about, um, you know, arsenic, which is kind of well known to be in rice, lead arsenic. Um, so I switched out the rice for sourdough bread. And I got an uh, organic, you know, locally grown um, uh, wheat flour uh, here from a producer here in Alberta, uh, which was glyphosate free. And I thought, okay, I'm, I'm good. So for eight months, I started, you know, I had changed to eating sourdough bread in place of the rice. Then what happened almost, you know, abruptly over kind of a three-day period, kind of after the eight months, was uh, I encountered, you know, incredibly dry, uh, dry skill, you know, amazing amount of, uh, of dandruff. And the rest of my skin was okay. There's a few dry spots on my hands. But, yeah, so that was nice. And I'm firmly convinced that that was nice. And it's actually the documented symptom of nice and toxicity is drying of the skin. And so, uh, you know, for the last eight years, I've been, you know, eliminated almost all niacin in my diet, other than maybe what comes from 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 beef, beef or bison. But uh, so th there is another culprit that I wasn't aware of. And, you know, sure, there are other culprits. So um, fortunately, here in the city I live in for the last you know, 20 years, we've been fluoride free. They're just reintroducing it now. Uh, so fluoride would be another, you know, another concern. Um, 
Yeah, there's some other, you know, there's obviously, you know, other toxins in our environment, but, you know, I'm thoroughly 100% convinced that vitamin A is, is a toxin, not that vitamin toxin. And I mean, most of my health recovery is due to the elimination of vitamin A versus, you know, other things. And I think this is proving out with um, the carnivore diet, you know, people on the carnivore diet that are, you know, purely muscle meat, they're even, even if they are including, you know, eggs or some dairy, um, you know, they're doing, overall, I think they're doing pretty well. It just happens to be another good, you know, you know, almost like if you pure muscle meat, um, the carnivore, almost the perfect, you know, vitamin A elimination diet. So um, not just me, you know, so, you know, I think it's, you know, it's, and we're getting more and more testimonials. So um, I think it's becoming more conclusive. Yes, there is something to this vitamin A theory. Yeah, definitely. And I want to get into the, the science more, but I'd like to talk a bit more about personal experience first. Um, so, um, yeah, you mentioned the carnival. That was the other thing I was going to ask about your diet. So we're not going to mention any names in this because we're not trying to, you know, create any controversy or anything. But but there is a, um, a, a, a kind of person in the anti-vitamin A camp who um, sometimes quotes you as saying that, you know, maybe a carnival diet is actually superior to the uh, kind of diet that, you know, um, that you've been following. And in terms of uh, cutting out carbs. Um, and so that's partly why I was interested in like how much of your calories in the last 10 years have been coming from carbs as opposed to just from meat, which would be only protein and fat, right? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to say, you know, probably 50% of my calories is from carbs. Like, oh, actually, so it's quite know, so, a lot then. Oh yeah. No, no. I, I, I've never been on the carnivore diet. And, but now based on what I know, I think, oh, the carnivore diet what might actually be better in some situations or some circumstances especially if you want to lose weight so if you're if you're you know chronically diseased with what i think are you know vitamin a toxicity symptoms and you want to lose weight then the carnivore diet is probably you know the the best strategy i think also i got to clarify that in the short term i don't think it's i don't think it's the ideal diet in the long term because i do think the body is you know conditioned and you know adapted to use glucose as a fuel source but if you want to lose weight, you got to get the insulin down. The way to get the insulin down is, you know, by reducing carbs. So, um, but interestingly enough, you know, I did not at all reduce my carbs. And, you know, if anything, I was probably high in carbs from, from a racial point of view. And yet I still lost weight. It took about two years for that to kick in. Um, but I think I can explain that. And I've got an upcoming blog post. I, about, I think it was back in 2018, I did a blog post on obesity causation. And I'm going to update that with kind of my current thinking on on the connection between vitamin A, insulin, obesity, and it really kind of ties ties it together. So um, that's that's kind of why I was thinking the carnivore diet. Also, I think the higher fat content of the carnivore diet would be a factor. Um, but you know, I'm I'm just speculating. Also, I need to be super clear. You know, I'm just speculating. And also, you know, looking at, you know, some of the success stories that are published in that carnivore uh, diet community, they're pretty, pretty, pretty um, dramatic and quite a lot of them. And the success rate seems to be really high. Now, are they fudging the data or just, you know, highlighting the success stories and minimizing, you know, the, um, the non-success stories possibly? But overall, I think, you know, the data is, you know, it's, it's turning out that, you know, yeah, it, it's, it seems to be working for a lot of people now. Is it sustainable over the long term? I don't think so, but um, you know, for the short term, probably. Yeah, and, and could this depend? You know, uh, I, I don't. We we haven't really talked about what I do, but you know, one of the things I do is um, I look at people's genetics quite often. And so um, now I understand, like for instance, I, when I'm on other people's podcasts, often they say, you know, is there a, uh, is genetics the cause of obesity? And I always say, look, hundred years ago, hardly anyone had obesity. Now. Most people do, so obviously no, it's not the cause. Uh, but it is a contributing factor as to why, when some people get poisoned, they become obese, and some people, when they get poisoned, they lose weight. You know, even like myself, for instance, right? So, you know, so genetics do play a part, even if they're not, you know, the the, the main uh, cause of various different things. And sometimes they are, you know, the main cause. There are certain conditions where gen genetics are more. And you know, even for you, right, that, that you had kidney disease as opposed to something else, or eczema as opposed to something else, there could be a genetic predisposition towards that once your body became you know toxic enough or whatever the root cause was we think toxicity obviously based on your experience um so i guess one question i have would be um do you think that 
biochemical individuality could play a part in it as well in the sense that like all right so let me give you an example of this i quite often see where people um like one of the things we do in our system is we look at nutritional needs and like for every <laughs> nutrient um every uh, amino acid every type of fat every type of um uh, vitamin and all the major minerals some people have an increased need now this is correlative based on the SNPs that they have um but basically all we're saying is people with certain SNPs on the same diet they will tend to have lower levels than other people so that would be what we class as an increased need and so I often see that people when they have that increased need um that they feel a lot better when they have that nutrient, even something as simple as like a, an individual amino acid or, or a mineral or whatever it might be. Okay, so let's just, you don't have to believe me, but for a second, just assume that all of that is the case. Um, so <laughs> if that's the case, one thing that we see less in that system, um, like I see some people who have like an increased need for vitamin A. Now, I, to be honest, when I see that, I'm like, you're probably just someone who um, his body is better at processing and eliminating vitamin A, which is why the correlative studies would show that people with your SNP would have lower levels of vitamin A. I don't know if that's a bad thing, is what I'll say to them. That might actually be a good thing. And, you know, in the people in the repeat world, right, uh, they believe serotonin is bad. And I see some people who, you know, have increased need for tryptophan and, and low serotonin. I say, maybe that's a good thing from your perspective, right? That you know, that you, you have that low tendency. So anyway, as you know, like a lot of uh, in, in science, uh, you know, genes control enzymes. And a lot of what enzymes do is they, like a lot of the function of how well the body works in all kinds of different areas is how fast or slow those enzymes function, right? How quickly or slowly they do that chemical conversion from one thing to another. So do you think there is a possibility um, that some people are just uh, more efficient and effective at uh, breaking down and eliminating vitamin A than others. And so therefore, uh, for some people, the effects of it are significantly more toxic than other people. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, you know, there's the classic, um, you know, I think the classic um, piece of data there is, you know, the you know, people with an Asian background have, you know, this flush reaction to alcohol. You know, those, I think those people would be much less um, uh, efficient at processing vitamin A. And in the very extreme, you know, out to the very extreme, I actually, you know, I was looking at cystic fibrosis and sickle cell anemia. I think both those conditions are, are conditions of uh, people that are not able to deal with uh, vitamin A pretty much at all. So I think those are are you know hyper hypersensitive people to, to vitamin A toxicity? So yeah, for sure, you know absolutely, no, no question. The genetics plays a role, and you know we're all different. And, you know, it's yeah, for sure, totally agree. Yeah, uh, um, you know, I've had a big issue of lead toxicity. That's been the thing for me. Like they found very high levels of lead in my blood. No recent exposure. My wife, who had the same you know environment and food and supplements and everything as me, roughly for over ten years, had almost no lead in her blood. I had lead in my blood, uh, 10 times the maximum reference range for the 97th percentile. Um, and I hadn't suspected it until I'd seen my genetics because I'd had hair mineral analysis and urine analysis before, and there was a negligible amount of lead in my hair and urine. And so when I had the genetic test and it said, your body is poor at processing and dealing with lead, I was like, well, that makes sense. It just stays in my blood. My body's not kicking it out through the hair like it should be. It's not kicking it out through the urine as it should be, and it's probably not a wild guess to say it's not kicking out through the bile and you know through the liver either like it should be and that's it's just building up in the blood and so all right so we're agreeing on all of that and that makes sense this is just a hypothetical but so is it possible um that vitamin a does have some function and some benefit but the problem is that first of all most people are having way too much and then some people can't process it at all. So even by the time they're maybe 20, they've already like saturated like a lifetime supply of all the vitamin A they're ever going to need. Um, and anything that get beyond that point is just more and more. Because it's like, is it a nutrient or is it a toxin? Like iron is an interesting one that 
Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about, including in the Ray Peak community, ironically, even though a lot of them really resist this talk of vitamin A potentially being toxic. Um, you know, th there are some gurus out there, again, I won't name them personally, but, you know, who claim that iron is the cause of all disease, unbound iron yes. specifically, right? Yeah, I don't know. No, I, I don't know either. But the point is that theory exists out there. So there are some people saying that iron is really toxic and really bad for you. And there are some people saying that, obviously, the mainstream perspective is really important. If you don't have enough of it, you're going to get anemia and, and all these other serious health problems. So do you think there's any chance that it could exist in that continuum where, yes, most people do have too much of it, and especially those people who have the genetics for it um, really suffer from having too much of it, but it does have some kind of role. It's just that, you know, we're way oversaturated with it overall as a culture. I think it's a bit of an academic argument because really, practically speaking, there's no way you're going to completely eliminate this from your diet. So with the body's well adapted to deal with some. But my position is no, there's no there's no positive benefit function of vitamin A in the human body whatsoever. And maybe um, you know, maybe I'm a little bit biased because I have a kind of a serious hatred towards this molecule. Uh, <laughs> but in the literature, uh, in the literature, there's there's um, understandable given the degree of healing you've had from not having it. So yeah, and you know, and, and yeah, it's, and we could talk for a long time. But um, in the literature, I was looking at uh, one of the lab techniques anyway for for doing testing of vitamin A, and in that in that particular paper, they actually cite vitamin A as being too toxic to be in serum outside of the retinal binding protein. So it's clearly known to be toxic. And then in some cell studies, um, uh, you know, just exposing cells to vitamin A, you know, in, in vitro causes the cells to become inflamed incredibly quickly. So directly causes inflammation. Uh, in one of the studies, I think on my blood glucose and diabetes, there's a new study that shows that vitamin A is actually fracturing the DNA. So not in all cases, but in some cases it causes the, the fracture of DNA. So when a molecule fractures your DNA, I'm pretty sure it's a toxin. Um, then on another study, I actually cited it in my ebook on breast cancer. Sorry, yeah. just to go back. Is there any other nutrient or something identified as a nutrient that fractures uh, DNA that you're aware of? I I don't know. Um, you know, maybe I I wouldn't. I don't, I, I, I don't, don't heard know. of it either. I'm just asking. Yeah, yeah because that would be a way of but qualifying. But you can imagine. That. Yeah, there would be other toxins that would be capable of doing that. Like um, mercury can do it, for instance, right? Sure. Yeah. You know, yeah, lots of lots of serious <laughs> toxins could do it. And then in another study, uh, I referenced it in my uh, ebook on breast cancer. Uh, what they showed was really quite fascinating. Was taking um, you know in a cell culture again, and yeah, cell cultures. You know, they're not great because they're so short term. But uh, in cell cultures with immune cells, what they found was, ex you know, induce some. Um, uh, stress condition on cells and the immune cells will come in and you know start to do their work with that same kind of study repeated the same kind of scenario repeated with vitamin a causes the immune cells to completely stall out and not not do their job so uh you know like clinically proven i suppose if you want to call it that you know or, you know or in vitro you know vitamin a is causing your immune cells to stop functioning like how bad is that you know like so if anyone wants to claim that this has some vitamin aspect to it, um, you know, you know, prove it as you do the study, you know, like redo the study. Like we've got one kind of study from 1926 that, you know, came to the conclusion that this molecule was a vitamin, which I, you know, call complete BS on. And if anyone wants to claim that it is a vitamin, redo the study, prove it, you know, show me the data. I don't want to hear the arguments anymore, kind of like I've heard them for 10 years and they're just, they're just being repeated and recycled over and over. It's just like, bring me the data, show me the data. Well, speaking of studies, so this was another claim I had someone make um, claiming that they got it from you that I would like to uh, like clarify. Um, so the original experiment, it kind of... It just to remind people of, uh, you know, the original experiment that proved vitamin A is a vitamin and essential. They gave rats this, uh, you know, very unnatural isolated diet uh, with certain ingredients, and then they changed one variable, and then the rats with the original recipe all died of horrific deaths, and the rats with the new recipe were all fine. And so the one variable that they changed is they replaced the lard uh, with butter. Am I correct so far? Yeah, I think so. Okay. So um, 
Now, so that's obviously the key variable, like the, the thing that makes the difference. So I guess um, my question would be, is there, is, there, is it, so, so, okay, first of all, let's talk about that claim I heard. So I heard someone claim that, um, that your position that the problem with lard is that it's high in retinoic acid, that you weren't basing that on anything, that you were basing that only on like your own experience with, with eating no, pork. No, no, no. Yeah, no, so I wanted they're, to they're... debunk that one. Yeah, yeah, no. I, and actually, there's a reference in my ebook on that. I think maybe even two references. So, no, there is, there's, there's studies showing that, you know, lard does contain what they call, what do they call it? Vitamin A activity, I guess. I think it's maybe the term. So, in you know, in the late, Whatever that was done, I think it was in the 1950s, uh, they wouldn't have known about uh, retinoic acid because it was discovered in, I think, 1960-ish. Uh, but there are studies saying, hey, you know what? We can induce the same effect uh, of vitamin A toxicity with lard. And so completely acknowledging there's some vitamin A factor in lard. Uh, so, you know, lard is, you know, just the way it's processed, right? It, you, you're taking, you know, pork fat, you're heating it in steam, you know, you know, you know the oxidation process of converting retinol to uh, retinoic acid is, you know, high temperature oxygen. You're going to oxygenate, oxygenate that carboxyl um, group on the end of that molecule. It's going to convert it into, you know, at least some of it into, into retinoic acid. Uh, it might not be very efficient, but it's going to, you know, it's going to cause some. Um, but yeah, yeah, there's a lot more has it ever been tested that there is retinoic acid in that type of lard, that high heat treated lard? I don't know. I, I I didn't, you know, do any kind of follow up, you know, you know, research on that. But you know, the kind of more important, I guess, fundamental claim of, you know, why I think that study was flawed because they use heated casein, and casein does. You know, there, there's new new studies, you know, modern day studies that shows that casein has actually in, in the one paper that I referenced on my updated blog post on this topic, it's a one-to-one -one ratio. So, you know, for every casein molecule, you've got a, a retinal molecule and retinoic acid in casein. So, you know, the claim of that original study of being a vitamin A free diet is completely invalid. No, it wasn't. It was clearly vitamin A in the, in the diet. So for them to claim that these animals have died from a vitamin A deficiency is completely, you know, garbage science because no casein has vitamin a in it the, the rats that were that had horrific deaths with the lard and the rats that were fine with butter like they both had casein right so that wasn't the variable that changed but you, you got two variables there right? it's, it's not just it's not just the retinol and the butter it's the extra fat well that's what i was going to get to yeah is it possible that there was something beneficial in the butter which oh yeah yeah, so oh, tell us yeah. about that, please. It's it's the higher fat content, and there is a study. I referenced this other one in my ebook, and I think from nineteen, I want to say nineteen eighteen, um, um, Mori, so a researcher in Japan, looking at kids, uh, young kids with um, this chronic disease condition. Uh, forget the name; I had a Japanese name. But he he ameliorated those disease conditions in a, in a in a in a study reasonably well done, just with butter. So just by giving these kids a high butter diet, you know, reverse their disease condition. It's the fat. It's the extra fat. Sure, it has some vitamin A in it, but the extra fat offsets that. And if you have extra fat in your diet, you're going to be eliminating more vitamin A in your bile. So yeah, it's the, it's that's what I think it is. It's the extra fat in the diet. When you say extra fat. Uh, isn't there the same amount of fat in 10 grams of lard as 10 grams of butter? Oh, no, I'm talking about the, the Mori study where, you know, uh, what is it? I, I'm not going to pronounce it correctly, where, you know, kids, you know, young, young, and young kids, I, I don't know, in Japan living off a of kind of standard Japanese diet, let's say rice and fish, and by adding butter to their diet, um, you know, that's the extra fat in that, in that scenario, um, uh, ameliorated the disease because the disease condition. Now, on the Wolbach and Hall study from 1925-26, you know, switching out the lard for butter, well, also, you know, the the fat composition of lard is different than the fat composition in butter, right? So it's, they didn't change just one variable. There's at least two being changed there. But regardless, there's just absolutely no way, uh, like any sensible person, 
you know, would know that an animal is not going to die in some horrible disease condition in eight to 12 weeks from a deficiency. Sorry, it's just not, never been seen in nature. It, you know, if that were true, virtually every animal in the wild would die every winter. It's, it's, it's just ridiculous. Genetic Insights provides cutting-edge, affordable DNA testing, giving you access to over 500 health reports that can help you in three key ways. They may be able to resolve your existing health challenges even when nothing else has worked. Using simple lifestyle changes, their reports can help you reduce your risk of developing future health challenges that you may be genetically predisposed to. And they can help you feel more confident in your health by showing you where you are genetically strong. Unlike most other genetic health testing companies, Genetic Insights tests over 83 million different variations in your genes, guaranteeing 99.7% accuracy across all of their DNA reports. They cover almost every aspect of health, including digestive issues, cardiovascular health, weight loss, hormonal and blood sugar balance, as well as nutrient needs, allergies and intolerances, and so much more. Using their system is quick and easy, and reading the reports is simple. If you've done an Ancestry DNA test, you can simply download your raw DNA data, upload it to the Genetic Insights platform, and within a few hours you will have access to genetic reports which give you a risk score for each specific issue and scientifically validated recommendations based on your individual genetic profile. Everything in your reports are based on scientific studies and there are citation links throughout every report. If you are serious about optimizing your health and wellness and feeling great, then getting access to your Genetic Insights reports may be the most important health investment you will ever make. In the reports, not only will you gain insights into how to overcome existing health challenges and avoid future issues, you'll also discover which types of dietary, lifestyle, and even supplement protocols are best for your unique genetics. To get your unique genetic health reports, go to geneticinsights.co and use code rejuvenate to get 20% off today. That's geneticinsights.co using coupon code rejuvenate to get 20% off today. Well, yeah, before we get to the animal ones, uh, which I did, you know, I know you did your own experiment and that's very relevant, but let's just talk about, uh, sorry, I want to clarify this thing about the difference between rats having exactly the same diet, except for one of them had blood, the other one had butter. The lard ones, horrific death. The butter ones, healthy and fine, right? That, that's, there's something significant about that to me. Um, and it's worth, if if people claim that you're wrong about the vitamin A thing, um, then I would like them to answer, okay, what is the difference? Why, why is lard so toxic that it kills these rats and, and butter is totally fine? Yeah, uh, that, that is interesting. Yeah, it would be interesting from, uh, yeah. You know, from a scientific point of view, just that, of course, it'd be very interesting to understand that difference. Um, but just so you know, you know, there's another person that repeated a small animal experiment. And uh, his name is Michael in Australia. He is um, mice. His mice lasted for a year. So, you know, not eight to 10 weeks, one year, 52 weeks, I think 51 weeks. Um, but, you know, for any of these doubters, you know, repeat the experiment. It, it's not going to cost you more than a hundred bucks, maybe tops two hundred dollars repeat the experiment okay you know, like, let's yeah let's talk about what that experiment is sorry so just to go back like with the like so the butter has some retinol right the as you say the lard the lard also has some vitamin a activity not 100 percent clear on what it is but it's some vitamin a um so the butter also has something called odd chain fatty acids is that something that you've come across i don't remember uh but yeah yeah the fat concept Content of butter is different. The composition is different than lard, so you know I, I forget that. Acids that are quite unusual, um, called old chain fatty acids, which there's some research showing that it's very protective. So uh, I am wondering if we're assuming that you know the vitamin A is toxic. I wonder if it's the protective effects of the old chain fatty acids in butter, which kept those rats healthy despite both of them having vitamin A. And if it's not that, I'd like to know what it is. Um, is butter something that you recommend, given you know that it had those benefits? I, you know, for me, you know, the ideal thing would be like a vitamin A free butter. If someone wants to bring that product to the market, I think it'd be fantastic. Um, and uh, I was speculating that you know, yes, some butter might be beneficial. Uh, some people in my forum had tried that, not with uh, positive results. But I'm I, I'm not convinced. Either way, like 
I kind of feel like my own diet is is too low in fat. It's you know probably far too low in fat. I just haven't found a safe form of fat or what I would consider a safe form of fat. Um, now the risk benefit of butter, I, I don't know. It might might depend on the person. Uh, I'm personally not going to experiment with that on myself, uh, but you know, other people can. I just think it's interesting. It made such a huge difference for those rats, you know, as you said. Um, uh, yeah, so interesting about the fats. You feel like you should be having more fat. So, you know, as you know, there's a, like there's another school of vitamin A um, toxicity that recommends to go very low fat in most situations, not all. Um, I don't quite understand the thinking behind that because to me, I would think uh, if you have a low fat diet, you're going to reduce the amount of bile being excreted. And so you're going to slow the whole process of detoxification down. Now, I think their argument is if you're consuming more fat, that um, you're also going to have more reabsorption of the bile, uh, of the vitamin A within the bile, which may also be true. But still, overall, I would think that uh, cholestasis, so where the bile stops flowing to the point that it becomes a problem, is much more likely to happen on a low fat diet. So I do every every person's different. Back to that genetics thing. So so I do recognize that, but I don't see that purposefully limiting fat um, in order to detoxify vitamin A really works like it makes sense so it's interesting that you say that you would like to have more fat in your diet so can you explain that for us a little bit more well exactly that thinking right i'm thinking uh you know you're compromising you know um, bile production and of course you know just generally the emulsification of any vitamin a uh, that does end up in circulation you want to you want to emulsify that in fat and hopefully, you know, get it captured by the liver and, you know, excreted with bile. So I think a, a low-fat diet, extremely low-fat diet is uh, not great. Now, just so happens, I chose bison as my, you know, meat source because it is, you know, the lowest vitamin A content meat that I could find. And the, the reason it's such a low vitamin A content meat is because it's very low-fat. It's, it's extremely low-fat compared to beef. I, I kind of think that was a mistake. Um, you know, if I could do it over again, I think I might have been better to go, you know, all beef, you know, you know, white fat and beef um, would probably speculating, you know, would have made a, made a, made a difference for me. Um, I don't know that I can't retest it. Uh, so, you know, even though I've done pretty well with, with the diet I did choose, I think it, it could have been improved and, you know, so if someone if someone were new and wanted to follow in your footsteps, you might recommend to them to use beef instead of bison too. Yeah, I think I would. Yeah, actually, and it's it's more readily available. Yeah, uh, it's less a little bit less costly. Um, yeah, I think I would. What about if someone wants to add more fat? You know, there's a lot of talk about the benefits of coconut oil all over the place. Is there a reason that you wouldn't use coconut oil? Uh, I, 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 I I'm just I believe it's very just, low vitamin A, right? Oh yeah, I think it is. Uh, technically, you know, zero zero vitamin A. So it might be really good. It's just. I was concerned about the processing of it. Like, how is this actually processed and, and um, you know, packaged and all? So I never really investigated it. Yeah, in theory, it would be, a, a, you know, a good source of fat. Um, I just don't know. I, I just didn't look at it in, you know, in any detail. Okay. But you're, you're open to the possibility. Yeah. Again, not for you, oh, but yeah. for someone else. Yeah. Okay. That's, that, that's interesting. Right. Let's talk about the experiment, as you mentioned a couple of times. Let's go to that. Like anyone else could do the experiment, as you said. Um, so people trying to debunk you, I think there's a lot of focusing on the details, but they do miss, as you just said, like this, this key point, which is if you... So, yeah, sorry. Can you tell us a story about your own experiment that you did? Let's start with that. Yeah. So, you know, I attempted to redo that Wolbach and Howell study, I guess. So I had, you know, two journals. I'm in Alberta. You're not allowed to have rats in Alberta. Um, so I used two journals, and I got them very young. I think they were four weeks old when I got them. And I put them on an extremely low, you know, hopefully close to zero vitamin A diet. You know, it was rice. Um, uh, I think a little bit of oatmeal. Water, I don't know, maybe not much else. Anyway, so my cooked, my cooked rice or raw, cooked rice, cooked rice, yeah, cooked rice, and uh, they lasted for thirty four weeks. So you know the Wolbach and Hall study, uh, their animals died in eight to twelve weeks. My animals died at thirty four weeks. But also there is this mitigating factor where I was keeping them in a garage and um, had the windows open in the garage because in the summer you know it gets pretty hot here. And we have a house uh, cheaper, and uh, 
there's a break in in the house next door. She got panicked and she went and closed all the windows. And the garage shot up to like 40 degrees, 40 some degrees Celsius, maybe maybe higher. Uh, and animals died from from heat exhaustion, heat to heat. And they, they both died as well within the same two days. And they're perfectly healthy until then. And then, you know, with that, you know, closing in the windows and the garage getting incredibly hot, they, they died. How long do gerbils normally live? About a year, I think one year. Okay, so they're already past the yeah. half their life point anyway. Okay. Yeah, but anyway, wait, wait. anyway, by the time they're 34 weeks, they are perfectly healthy animals. I, I did a, a weekly video recording of them. You know, they're still up on YouTube. People can go watch those videos and, you know, watch the one at 32 weeks or 30 weeks. And you tell me those are those are sick and diseased animals. No way. They're, they're perfectly healthy. Uh, so there, I think, you know, that, you know, goes a long ways to debunking the little walk and house study. And then, like I said, there was uh, another person in Australia who repeated it with, with mice. And his animals lasted, you know, say, 51 weeks. Um, and I'll, I also made some mistakes in my small animal experiment. I had two males in the same cage. Shouldn't have done that. Um, should separate them into uh, separate cages. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, you know, it's a simple experiment. Anybody can repeat it. And you know, I hate to call it an experiment because it sounds like you're experimenting, you know, just consider it, you know, keeping pets and just see how long you can keep these, these pets alive um, on a restricted diet. Um, yeah, just repeat the experiment. Yeah, yeah, very, uh, very interesting. Um, uh, yeah, I'm tempted to do it myself. I forgot about uh, that you actually had gerbils because I wouldn't want to have rats in the house, but I think I had gerbils as a kid. I think they're uh, reasonably, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Good pets. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they're nice little fun animals, actually. I have too many cats, uh, so that might be a problem, but maybe I could find a room for them. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah, I would definitely encourage anyone to. And you you, were, you didn't say 100% certain about what you fed them, so just to clarify, like... It's, it's in my ebook. Okay, it's in the ebook. It's in my ebook. I documented the exact diet. I think it's maybe peanuts or something. Did you say occasionally? Um, I might have, but then I switched to giving them macadamia nuts, which they really liked. Uh, and yeah, I think it was rice, some oatmeal. Um, so the most nuts and grains, none of which have vitamin A. Yeah, I, you know, as far as I could tell, macadamia nuts are, are free of, of vitamin A. Um, yeah, but I, I did document the diet that I used. Uh, no, I'm not saying it's the perfect small animal diet and I'm most, certainly not like a qualified small animal keeper you know I don't have any history or background in doing that um, but yeah you can repeat the experiment yeah interesting um, well I, I think that's uh, you know uh, definitely an experiment worth doing if you would like to see it for yourself uh, I definitely think that you're right that there was some serious flaws in that experiment as I, I'm still interested in this, like, what was so bad about lard versus butter <laughs> thing. I'd have to look it up as to um, yeah. what, like, is lard supposed to be okay for a rodent? Like, is it innately toxic? And, and if so, why is it innately toxic, as you said, right? Like, what what is it about it? I got to suspect that there's been some HPLC work done on lard and, you know, the retinoic acid content. It's almost for sure there. Like, it's, like, humans accumulate vitamin a or adipose tissue and so so you know pigs will too right so you take that and the rendering process of lard you know they they take that the carcass and the hide they expose it to steam and they you know it all kind of you know runs off and they collect it well that's that's you know one way of generating retinoic acid for sure like it's yeah, for sure it's just oxidization of, of retinol right so wouldn't surprise me at all to see, like, I would fully expect lard to have retinoic acid. Yeah, and I, I've been surprised a small portion, again, of this community are, like, advising people to uh, eat uh, pork products. I'm like, huh? Where, where has this come from? Because uh, whether it's the retinoic acid or whatever it is, it's certainly not beneficial to eat pork, I think. Um, and uh, I, I don't know. Um, yeah. I, I don't. And, you know, I had an interesting You would not uh, recommend pork, when I just to clarify. No, no, I would not recommend pork. And when I first started this, uh, I was really sick, right? Like, I, as I mentioned at the, at the outset. But one of the things I did was, okay, I'm going to go on this low vitamin A diet and, you know, Google the vitamin A content of, you know, all these foods. I'm trying to find, some, you know, what am I going to eat? And then I find, oh, I can eat steak. Okay, great. No, there is a God. And then, I, you know, same with pork. Pork, pork meat is documented to be relatively low. And I... I had some pork roast, and I, I tell you, the reaction was 
almost immediately within 10 minutes, I had this huge flare up, you know, huge amount of inflammation. It was just by eating, you know, you know, I don't know, a couple hundred grams of pork. So that was it. <laughs> never touched it again and, and probably never will for the rest of my life. You know, Fair enough. Uh, yeah, I, I've always found the smell of it cooking even disgusting because I was in a house fire once where I had about 10% burns on my body and the smell of pork cooking is the same as human flesh, right? It's very similar, oh, as you said in your book. Really? So Yikes. It, it always reminds me of that. It's a bit cannibalistic <laughs> eating pork to me. But anyway, um, let's go back to the vitamin A detoxing thing. And again, for those watching, you don't have to believe it's a toxin like Grant does, like I'm leaning towards. But you can just say, look, most people have too much of it. That's, you know, in, in this modern age, certainly by the time they reach a certain age. So we want to lower the amount of it. And I, you know, just clinical experience for a second. Uh, I do see, I, I have people test for it whenever they have the money to, um, if I'm seeing them. And uh, I often see high levels of uh, serum retinol uh, hand in hand with inflammatory conditions, allergic conditions, autoimmune conditions. So it's, it's, I admit it's a, you know, not massive, um, it's, it's anecdotal, but you know, I see it in practice uh, frequently. So I'm often guiding people to reduce the vitamin A as much as possible without them having to necessarily believe that it's bad, you know, right? Just like you have you have too much, that we're sure of, so let's get it down. And then also let's support getting out of the body. So in that regard, uh, you know, a while ago, you very kindly um, put a comment underneath uh, my video on cholestasis, uh, explaining that, you know, you are a fan of using activated charcoal um, as a way of uh, helping to uh, bind bile and stop it being reabsorbed. And of course, if you're binding bile and stopping it being reabsorbed, then you're also binding all the toxins bound up in the bile and stopping them from being reabsorbed. Yes, for sure. Yeah. Activated charcoal is, is you know, documented as kind of the go-to antidote for acute vitamin A toxicity. So, you know, clearly proven, used in hospitals and ambulances for not just vitamin A toxicity, but all kinds of poisoning. So, but it's, it's actually documented. If you look up, um, I think I shared a, a link uh, to the recommended procedure for, you know, acute vitamin A toxicity is retinoic acid. So absolutely, I think retinoic acid uh, or, um, is activated charcoal. Sorry. <laughs> yes, yeah. Uh, and I was recommending that for a while, uh, and uh, I still do recommend it because it's cheap, it's easily available, there's a lot of research behind it. Um, there is talk that it will bind up nutrients if you have it too close to food. My personal experience is the only reason I wouldn't have a lot of it with food is because I think it might soak up stomach acid, so it interferes with digestion that way. But, um, you know, all the research shows that the only nutrients that it binds up are vitamin A <laughs> and vitamin E, right? So um, uh, unless you're very concerned with vitamin E depletion, I guess, uh, like there really is no concern with that. And, you know, the fact that it binds those two things, I do think it puts a little bit of a pall of suspicion on vitamin E as well, especially one of the ways that the mainstream media often likes to debunk like vitamins as being beneficial as they say, oh, all these, these studies that show if you have too much, they're bad for you. And often they use vitamin E or vitamin A to show that high levels of them actually have like a potentially detrimental effect in people. Um, so, so that's great. So we're both on the same page about, uh, you know, charcoal potentially. Uh, my only issue with charcoal is you've got to be careful of using too much because it could constipate you. And if you constipate, obviously you're slowing down the removal of poison. So it's a bit of a, a diminished returns in that regard. Um, but I, I'd say the more, the better, so long as it doesn't poison you really, sorry, so long as it doesn't block you up really because it, of how effective it is removing poisons. What about uh, cholestyramine? That's one that I've switched to. I've been using it this year. Um, it's significantly more effective as a bile sequestrant. In fact, it's a hundred percent effective. Um, I think charcoal is more like 50% or something like that. So, uh, you know, it's extremely um, powerful and effective. Um, have you got any experience with that or do you have any opinions on it? No, no, I don't. No, no experience, no opinions. I'm, you know, never looked at it actually. Yeah. Well, I, I would recommend looking into it. I have felt significantly better this year using cholestyramine. Um, and I think that must be one of the reasons why, because it is more, I think I definitely had toxic bile. Uh, for various reasons, I think because of having cholestasis for many years, partly because of being on a low-fat diet, partly because of being on a low-choline diet and um, causing cholestasis. 
Um, no, um, I was saying because of a low ketogenic diet and a low fat diet, I developed cholestasis. And because, because I had cholestasis for many years, I developed more and more toxic bile, I would say, because it wasn't moving. And so it is very toxic. And so cholestyramine, in my experience, is the best. I think it's a gum resin. Um, I think it's, uh, yeah, anyway. Um, so if anyone watching, it's something, uh, obviously Grant doesn't endorse it. Uh, I do tentatively, I would say, you know, look into it potentially if you're interested in accelerating your progress, um, because it's just so effective at, you know, uh, adsorbing bile in general, it's, it's going to help with stopping the vitamin E be reabsorbed. Okay. So that's cool. Um, yeah, I, I, we talked before we started recording about, um, you know, the, the, there's been other kind of, um, attempts to, uh, debunk your work you said you perhaps wanted to you know address some of that is that something sure um yeah again i i, I you know i watched some of those videos and I, I put up a blog post kind of trying to address it i think you know there's a fundamental logic flaw there where um well what uh mike has done is he's looked at you know the studies i'd referenced in my ebook and he used those as a basis for his extrapolation of you know how much vitamin a you need to consume before you get in trouble with it well the fundamental problem is that those studies are looking at you know lethal you know, lethal doses of vitamin a and those studies are actually deliberately poisoning these animals literally to death with vitamin a and so uh you know that's that's a huge flaw in the logic so his his conclusion was oh you'd have to you know consume these massive doses of liver eggs before you get into trouble but it's it's completely flawed logic and you know my analogy would be if we're going to look at um, automobile accidents and say you know let's say we come into this saying no automobiles are perfectly safe and you know they cause no harm kind of my exposition um but it's flawed logic because if we did that analysis with automobile accidents and we looked at you know automobile accidents let's say over 100 kilometers an hour and we see geez at 100 kilometers an hour or higher you know most accidents are resulting in a fatality so therefore you know by conclusion you know anything less than 100 kilometers an hour is perfectly safe there's no risk in driving an automobile that's kind of you know by analogy you know his um analysis which is you know in my opinion very very flawed um and of course we have the real world data you know we have just so many testimonials now of people who have been eating uh, liver, you know, oftentimes from coming from a carnivore diet that included liver, and their health has been, you know, quite destroyed. Um, a year or two ago, I was getting probably one email a week from somebody else, you know, being, you know, having, you know, serious health consequences of consuming liver and not the massive doses that, that Mike was claiming in his video that are needed, you know, so real world evidence, you know, shows that no, you, you don't need to do anything kind of crazy like what Mike was suggesting. So that's my take on it. Yeah, thank you. And, you know, again, it makes sense, uh, even... Let's say, even if there's some validity to their argument, it makes sense because again, this idea of biochemical individuality, right? That the dose, the dope, the dose of poison that is going to create a poison effect in you, maybe you know, maybe you have ten times as much resilience to it as I do, and so to treat everyone as if they're the same, I think, is always a mistake. I try not to be antagonistic or argumentative of anyone, but anyone who acts like everyone is the same or everyone is roughly the same they're wrong. There is such a huge difference between people and their capacity to deal with different poisons and their, you know, their need for different nutrients and all of this basic stuff. So to treat everyone as if they're the same is always a mistake, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, yeah, so uh, thank you for that. Um, well, let's, let's um, so we've done a lot of uh, uh, <laughs> talking about challenges, objections, like um, things that people may have thought of themselves, things that people may have heard. One of the things I, I do want to say is, uh, like, so I used to teach a breathing practice back a long time ago, like maybe 15 years ago. And I used to teach people that it was a way of like increasing the oxygen in their system. Then maybe 10 years later, I learned about Taiko and I realized that um, um, actually, like, Increasing oxygenation really isn't that beneficial. It's hyperventilation. Um, it creates certain effects, but you know it's perhaps not that positive. Um, and what I realized actually, probably the value in the breathing practice that I was teaching ten years before was actually that even though it was taking quite deep breaths, it was really slowing down the breathing massively. And probably actually the benefit was coming from 
reducing the overall amount someone was breathing, say liters per minute, as opposed to increasing it. And so I say that to say this, I think sometimes um, it matters less are like reasons for recommending something. And what matters a lot more is what we're recommending and does it work? <laughs> and in case of that breathing practice, I stand by it that it made people feel better. It was a very relaxing breathing practice for people who were feeling stress and tense. And so what I've noticed with interest is that, you know, I've had someone else on my channel, I don't know if you want me mentioning him in this vein, but he, he kind of comes from an opposite school of thought from you. But when asked about like, what's an ideal diet for someone having any health challenges, it was basically beef and some kind of simple carb that agrees with you, whether it's rice or apples or something like that. And I was like, so it's interesting that even with a completely different theoretical framework, <laughs> the conclusion, because, and so this is the great thing, and I try and only have people like you who are you know, honest and have integrity and are well-meaning. Um, and so even when they have completely different theories about how things work and all the rest of it, the bottom line is if you're dealing with a lot of clients and when you have people coming to you and you're not one of those narcissistic people that says, oh, if, if it's not working for you, you must not be doing it right, but you actually listen to people and, and you know take feedback and all the rest of it, in the end, you're going to come to the same conclusions, which is that, you Interesting. know, <laughs> like, like a, a healing diet is probably going to be uh, some kind of protein that you agree with, beef being very commonly good, especially for men, it seems, for whatever reason. Uh, beef or bison, really, you know, um, and, uh, usually not pork. I mean, I would say that's probably one of the worst, but some people do do better on chicken, for instance, right? That, that does happen. Um, but uh, And then some kind of simple carb that agrees with you. Um, and, and, and for, uh, and then, you know, there's actually low in vitamin A, probably low in a bunch of other stuff as well. Um, and that can be a diet that takes someone from being really sick with all kinds of chronic diseases to being really well and really healthy. And so I think that's one of the bottom lines that I want people to take from this. Like, um, you don't have to believe the theory to do what Grant's suggesting and get a lot of benefit, right? That's the bottom line. Uh, um, and so to kind of come full circle to that, like um, I know that you're not a doctor, I'm not a doctor either. Um, so it, this is why I use the word suggesting, right? You're certainly not prescribing anything, but um, for someone who is interested in to maybe having the same, you know, interested in the possibility of having the same complete uh, rejuvenation of their, their health and well-being that you had, what would be kind of in your list of suggestions for them to do? First, I want to acknowledge like everybody's an individual and, you know, results are going to be very individualistic, of course. Uh, and I think uh, the other thing I want to say right up front is the expectation of time frame, right? This, there's no quick fix to having, you know, substantial recovery and health. It's going to take time. Now, how long? I don't know, one, two years, maybe more. Um, but I think what I would suggest, I think, uh, like I said before, the carnivore diet is probably pure muscle meat. Carnivore diet is probably um, one of the first things I would start with uh, if you can do it without the carbs. Now, I think in the carnivore diet community, they've kind of vilified carbs. They're saying, oh, carbs are the reason, you know, we've gotten sick and we've gotten obese. And so let's get rid of carbs. I, I don't agree with that. I think carbs are not uh, the cause of it. They're, they're a player, but they're not the cause. And so... Um, you know, if you want to lose weight and recover your health, carnivore diet is probably a good starting point. But eventually, what's going to happen, which happened to me and um, there's some other people I know, is you're going to, regardless of the consumption, continued consumption of carbs uh, or not, you're going to reduce your insulin resistance. And once that happens, uh, yeah. even with the consumption of carbs, uh, your insulin levels are going to be coming down and you're going to lose the weight. So the question is like, how quickly do you want to lose weight if you, if you do want to lose weight at all? So I think, um, I, you know, a muscle meat, you know, beef, muscle meat diet, plus like a, a, a carbohydrate, whatever you, agrees with you. Um, you know, there's some concerns about rice, um, that you need to be aware of, even though that's what I use. Um. You know, maybe potatoes and potatoes agree with you. I don't know. Uh, and also there's some fruits too, right? So you don't have to eliminate all fruit. And uh, like apples are, are great. I think even bananas kind of, you know, they're a good source of potassium. 
sure they have a tiny bit of mon vitamin A, but I would kind of it's negligible. I wouldn't concern myself about that. So there are some fruits also, right? So you don't have to, um, you know, go down to like two food groups. You can actually have, um, you know, uh, meat, starch, and, and and fruits also. So I think you know, and just you know, really kind of focus on eliminating the big ticket vitamin A items out of your diet, and uh, you know, with the extra extra uh, meat from a muscle meat diet, I think, you know, it's going to, you know, be a really healthy strategy for a lot of people. Yeah. And as I said, even people who completely don't know about your theory, disagree with your theory, they're still coming to the same conclusion. And that tells me there's some real truth to it, right? Yeah. And I, th I, I that's why I find the, the carnivore diet so fascinating because as far as I know, nobody, almost nobody in that community is, is looking at vitamin A. You know, I'm going, oh, you know, I know why that's working because it's a low vitamin A diet. Um, but yeah, they're getting results, right? So let's let's just focus on the real world results and just set aside the academic debates and, and go with the results. Yeah, absolutely. In an ideal world, you'd meet all of your nutritional needs in the form of vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients, and more from the foods you eat. However, unless you prepare all of your food at home from scratch using the highest quality ingredients possible, the reality is that most of us need some nutritional support. Most of us need to take supplements if we want to look, feel, and perform at our best on a consistent daily basis. And this is especially true if you have genes that give you an elevated need of certain nutrients. And this is where Feel Younger can help. What I love about Feel Younger is that they offer a huge range of quality supplements and healthcare products formulated and endorsed by Owen Robinson, including must-haves like magnesium glycinate and vitamins B12, D3, and K2. And they do it at affordable prices with free shipping for orders over $50 without ever compromising on quality, purity, or potency. To learn more about how Feel Younger supplements can give your health a boost while supporting this podcast, please visit feelyounger.net and use promo code rejuvenate to get 20% off your first order. That's promo code rejuvenate for 20% off your first order at feelyounger.net. Now, I think you're pretty minimalist and like, in terms of not adding stuff to it. Uh, you talked about charcoal potentially, especially, I guess, if someone is feeling worse, um, that'd be something that you'd recommend. Is there, do you, is there a particular, f like, you know, whenever I talk about stuff like this, people are like, oh, when should I take it? How much should I take? All that kind of stuff. I, I mean, I realize it is very individual, but are there any guidance? Like, would you, for instance, tell people to have it with food or not with food? You know, is there any kind of guidance you'd give around charcoal? Well, I, I, I really don't. Uh... You know, personally, I've taken it in the evening, just just what I do. Uh, and I actually don't use it very much anymore. But um, so I don't have any guidance around that other than what you mentioned about, you know, the dose. You have to be careful not overdo it because you will, you know, definitely, you know, uh, there's potential, um, um, you know, blocking yourself up and having constipation. So you don't want to go too overboard with it. Um, so I, I think... The other thing people need to be aware of, and for whatever reason, like we're seeing it over and over and over, is when people take on a low vitamin A diet, they end up having more vitamin A coming into circulation. And that's we, you know, wherever this was termed as a detox setback. So you need to be aware of that and kind of have a plan, a strategy for, for dealing with that. And I think the activated charcoal is kind of one of those strategies. And for liquids, you're only drinking water. Is there anything else that you have? Uh, I have. I've had, yeah, water and coffee. Uh, it's the only, you know, I haven't just thinking if there's anything else now, just water and coffee. So I was, you know, I was on the coffee for most of these 10 years. I got off the coffee for a year, felt great. My, my sleep quality over the last 10 years has been radically improved. So when I first started this, I had severe, crazy chronic fatigue and insomnia combined, which is anyway, uh, and that, that, that resolved. And so my sleep quality is, turned to be, you know, very good. And then when I went off the coffee, that sleep quality went from very good to fantastic. You know? So, uh, but for whatever reason, you know, a new job and everything, I got back on the coffee this year. So I, I don't think coffee is terrible, I, but it's just black coffee. And so um, that's, that's it. I'll eat or have for but it's okay. I mean, I guess it, it helps with it helps reduce constipation. Uh, you know, on, on the positive side. Yeah, it sure does. I, I don't know if I I wouldn't go as far as saying I don't recommend it. Um, kind of you know borderline recommendation because yeah, I do like the kind of laxative effect it gives me in the morning, and uh, you know I like starting my my day kind of empty. I can say that. Um, so there might be some beneficial effect of the coffee. And there's been a few people contacting me doing coffee enemas and saying that they're getting great results with these coffee enemas. I don't know about that, but, um, you know, it's like, once again, I'm just looking at 
you know, real world results. What are, what are people actually seeing? And so there might be something to that. The other thing that I've done over the last 10 years is um, plasma donations. I think that's beneficial. You can actually do the math on it and see that it is. Um, it might not appeal to everybody, but you know, that's something else that somebody can consider. Yeah. And sorry, let's just explain that. So that's giving blood, right? And so other than for altruistic reasons, why would someone do that? Well, here in Canada, you know, it's, it's, it's voluntary. You don't get paid for it at all. There's no, you know, in the United States, they actually pay you for it, which is if you're in the U.S., you, you know, make 40 <laughs> bucks a donation or something. Yeah, it's uh, the same here. It's donation only, yeah, in the U.K. Yeah, so, uh, but yeah, for, yeah, there's, in Canada, there's a huge uh, demand for blood and plasma products. But the distinction between, you know, a plasma donation and a blood donation. So blood donation is taking whole blood. So they're taking, you know, you're, you're basically... You know, you, you get a needle and they drain a, you know, let's say, you know, close to a liter of blood, uh, which is red blood cells plus the plasma. Whereas if you do a plasma donation, you keep your red blood cells and they centrifuge uh, out the plasma. So that's, you know, anything in, in the blood that's not, you know, red blood cells, I suppose. So you get a much higher concentration of any um, retinal binding proteins and vitamin A being taken out with that donation. So in my mind, it's a more effective way of reducing your vitamin A um, content. Now, you know, some people concerned about plasma donations. I don't know. Um, I, I do them. I, you know, I don't, I'm not really kind of buying into the theory that there's something, you know, uh, risky about it. You know, a lot of people, when I go make these plasma donations, are on, you know, like, Hundreds, hundred fifty. Last time we went, this woman beside me was on her seven hundredth plasma donation. So, you know, seems to be safe. Honestly, I hadn't heard of it as a. I mean, I I knew it existed, but I had not heard of it as a thing that was regularly done. Maybe it isn't in this country. I have to look into it. No, if if, if I, I'm assuming it is. If you just go to the you know blood donation clinic or you know get online and you can do a whole blood whole blood or plasma donation. Is it for people who are like concerned about anemia or something that they would only give the plasma and not um, the red blood cells? You know, I've asked and um, you know, I, I don't think there's a kind of a standard answer, you know, why people are making plasma donations versus whole blood. Uh, I'm pretty sure that virtually nobody's doing it for health reasons. I was going to um, say, yeah, they're not doing it for the same reason yeah. as you <laughs> normally. <I'm sure>. No, <laughs> uh, but so, but the, you know, it's called, um, uh, anyway, the, the organization had in Canada that, that Manages that's um, you know they they have a requirement both for whole blood and plasma, so they make this you know distinction. Hey, we need plasma donations and we need whole blood donations. <laughs> and so, uh, but I I got onto it just by by chance actually because when I when I started doing these blood donations, my nurse was saying, "Oh wow, you have really you know nice big juicy veins, and you're you're a great candidate for doing plasma." I go, "Oh okay, I'll do plasma." So I I didn't do it originally for um, you know trying to reduce my vitamin A content, but actually just by coincidence, it turns out, oh yeah, that would be a more effective way of, of reducing your vitamin A content. Hmm. And how often do you do it or how often have you done it? I've been doing it about four times a year, uh, but I'm going to at least double down on it now, maybe quadruple down on it. So I'm going to be going once every once every 10 days probably for the next year because I, I want to get a vitamin A serum level test that says 0.0. So I'm, I'm on an absolute mission. I'm going to get it. Okay. Well, maybe try the cholestyramine in that regard as well because it, it should block 100% of reabsorption um, in the intestines. Okay, yeah, very interesting. I, I did not know about that, so that's that's very interesting. I'll see if it is available here. Um and then just in terms of anything else, I'm just trying to think. I, I, I'm pretty sure you're, you know, you don't use supplements otherwise. What about salt? Do you have salt on food? Uh, yeah, I do. Not, not too much or too often. But yeah, I, I typically, I don't know, pinch of salt a day maybe. Uh, maybe really, you know, pinch of salt every three days kind of thing. Whatever a pinch is, right? You know, just between your index finger and your thumb kind of thing. Very small amount. And do you still see a doctor? Like, uh, are they, do, have they ever expressed any opinion on this amazing turnaround from this, uh, you know, terminal diagnosis? No, no. And I, I have gone to see my doctor for one, I have to go in and make this excuse to get a, uh, a vitamin A test here. Uh, but yeah, they, they've showed no curiosity, um, <laughs> no curiosity whatsoever. Yeah, they're just, they, they've got this waiting room full of sick people. So they're not going to waste time asking questions, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, you're right. Yeah, it's, it's a shame. That's the whole healthcare system, right, which is a separate conversation. I was just, just wondering if anyone had expressed any interest. Um, well, very interesting. Is there anything you want to add before we finish here, Grant? You know, with my encounter with niacin, I started, you know, looking at that. So, you know, my conclusion, my own conclusion is that, you know, eating uh, or consuming, you know, a flour product that's fortified with niacin, most certainly here in Canada, probably in the U.S., uh, you know, that's turns out to not be safe, which is just mind blowing um, to me. Um, the other thing I thought I'd mention is, you know, this uh, had a bit of what when I started looking at nice and I started looking at um, uh, sodium bicarbonate, you know, baking soda is that potential antidote to um, retinoic acid. And I think, you know, there's, there's probably something to that. So it's something else that's on my radar uh, to kind of look more into. Uh, so I think, you know, low dose uh, baking soda might be beneficial for some people. Um, not recommending it, but suggestion. Yeah, there's actually a lot of um, evidence around this. I, I dove into this quite deeply. I read a book on it by um, it's called Dr. Mark Circus or something like that, claiming to be able to heal all kinds of serious and even life-threatening illnesses just with baking soda. I mean, definitely with kidney disease. I think that's even mainstream that um, that sodium bicarbonate can help with that. Um, different mechanisms, I think, have been proposed. You know, the old way of thinking of about it, I think, was the like the alkalizing effect. Um, I think also because it's a carbon donor, so it helps to increase the level of carbon dioxide in the system, which is um, obviously uh, very beneficial if you understand that most people are actually carbon dioxide depleted in their system. Um, I used it for a long time. It's also antihistamine. That's interesting. So people have a histamine reaction. Uh, if, as soon as you have sodium bicarb, it will calm that down. Uh, the one thing is that it can potentially alkalize your digestive tract. Um, and if that basically um, the bacteria that consider like the good bacteria, like the lactobacillus and bifobacterium, um, are acid forming. That's really one of the main things about them that makes them beneficial is actually that they reduce the pH of the intestinal environment. So I think I actually probably ultimately created digestive problems inside myself by using too much sodium bicarb. Um, <laughs> and so that's my only warning for people. But, you know, Maybe, maybe that's a worst case scenario as long as you have a moderate amount. You know, you don't obviously overdo it. But obviously, if you're saving yourself from a life threatening disease, as you know, it's been documented with sodium bicarb, it can be, uh, you know, it's more than worth it in that regard. And uh, so I, I think that's a very fruitful um, avenue of investigation. The retinoic acid is um, interesting. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I won't, I won't talk about that here because it's just speculation, but um, I, I, I think um, I think I 100% agree with you that uh, that could potentially, like charcoal, be a very good buffering agent if someone is going through, you know, maybe a high level of uh, detoxification of that particular molecule. That makes sense to me as well. Okay, yeah. Well, I think that's about it from my side. You know, I've got um, <clears throat> some other... Uh, projects that I'm interested in investigating uh, that I talked about in my my 10 year update. So that's kind of going to be my focus for kind of spring of 2025. Uh, I'm still very interested in the vitamin A topic. I haven't been very active in it at all. Just been too busy and just kind of you know waiting for things to kind of evolve here. Uh, but uh, maybe. Maybe next year I'll be back into it. Maybe. Well, it's interesting, you know, there's this political movement now to investigate the root causes of chronic diseases. And you know, they're talking about various environmental toxins. And they're talking about like the mid 80s that a lot of these environmental toxins were introduced. Um, when was vitamin A fortification in, you know, foods introduced? Depends by country. I think in Canada it was 70. Two or seventy four, and same in the United States, seventy two, seventy four kind of time frame. Um, yeah, so interesting because yeah. I know but you, you would know, say that's potentially a contributing factor, right, to the chronic disease epidemic is the the fortification. I wonder if that's something that will come up. Maybe, um, but the other thing you know that people need to be aware of is um, you know the seed oils and especially the canola oils. So canola oil has a high concentration of uh, beta carotene. And in Canada, for whatever crazy reason, so you know, Canada is a big producer, big consumer of canola oil, so is the United States. But in Canada, anything canola oil that we export is 
I think either doubled or tripled uh, the beta carotene content just for whatever reason they're doing that. So, you know, that's highly toxic. You know, you, you, you really need, people need to be aware of that risk. Like lots of people kind of vilify the seed oils because of the PUFA content or something. I'm going, well, I, I, don't, I don't care about that. Look at the carotenoid content. It's, it's generously high. It also extra dangerous because it's pre-emulsified in, in a fat and a lipid. So you know, your absorption of that's going to be very high. So seed oils are you know, off the menu for sure for a good long time. That's a different reason you'd avoid seed oils. Um, then is the carotenoid content. I mean, do they all have it? Is sunflower seed oil, uh, I'm trying to think, soy oil? Do they all have some degree of carotenoids? I have a study looking at the, the carotenoid content of most of these oils. It's actually done in, in China. It's a pretty recent study. Um, and they're all, they're, they're all have, you know, a significant amount of carotenoids. So some are less than others, of course. Uh, some of the ones that I noticed that were unusually high, well, of course, canola oil, soy, soybean oil was high. Um, I, I'd have to look, but... You know, I just stay away from the seed oils. You don't need them. You know, why even take the risk kind of thing? Interesting. So maybe another case of what I was talking about a little bit earlier, that, you know, there's a whole community of people telling people to avoid them for one reason. Maybe the reason you just said is actually the right reason to avoid them, but it doesn't really matter that much as long as you avoid them. It doesn't matter. Just, <laughs> just avoid them. Yeah, like, like the plague, man. I just want to go back to, sorry, talk about fortification. I just want to go back to talk about fortification for a second, because I, I will say as a UK person, I've looked into this. There's very little fortification in the UK of our food with uh, vitamin A. Um, I, uh, I get dairy. Dairy is the one thing I have. I know you disagree with that still has vitamin A, and I get it from a local farmer. And uh, I asked them before, do you put any vitamin A in this? They're like, no, what on earth are you talking about? Like, you know, it would never, would never occur to them. Um, and yet I, I see like in vitamin A... Um, I don't know if you saw this, but there was a, a South Park episode. I don't know if you've ever seen South Park. Um, uh, it's like, you know, it's a satire, right? Um, and they were, making, they were making fun of the energy drinks that people are putting out there. And, and one of the jokes was like, more vitamin A than a human being could ever consume. This is like this advert for this energy drink and this satire. And I thought it was a joke. And then I looked at how much vitamin A there actually are in these, um, I don't know what to call it, celebrity energy drinks. I was like... Oh my God, they weren't joking. It actually, I think it was like two, 200 or 300% of the RDA of vitamin A in one bottle of this stuff. Wow. It's like, wow. Wow. Like, <laughs> what on earth are they doing? Um, and so, this is the thing. Even if you, you know, you've watched this whole thing, you're still not convinced, you still think that vitamin A is a nutrient. I understand, obviously, it involves questioning the whole you know, basis of vitamin science really right from the beginning. And a lot of people, they like to go along with the crowd, right? As opposed to, um, you know, thinking f things through for themselves from first principles. So you don't have to necessarily uh, believe everything we've said, but just recognize that, um, especially if you're in the US and you mentioned Canada as well, you are being given way more than even is the RDA in most cases. And certainly if you're eating any processed food, um, so even if you want to believe the mainstream perspective and you believe that the R, you know that you should be getting 100% of the RDA, recognize that this is no one in the mainstream disagrees that this has toxic effects in excess. And so, yes, if you're getting 200% or 300% of the RDA as opposed to 100%, if you do that one day, it's not going to be a problem. But as Grant points out, it's the fact if you do it for a year, if you do it for a decade, if you do it for five decades, and you're consistently having two or three times the amount, that's where you get this accumulation to the point where it, even by a mainstream perspective, it can cause serious life-threatening health issues. And I think that's the thing that's ignored by people. Yeah. Now, recently, I had a, someone send me an email, and they had done the math on so they, they looked at the consumption of, uh, I think it was just canola oil in the United States, the per capita consumption. And then they did the math on that and they said, you know, I, didn't, I didn't check their math, but what they said was it's 10x the RDA. So what people are getting from, from canola oil only in the United States is 10x the RDA. Forget about everything else. So then, yes, you have, you have the dairy and all these other things. So, you know. It's conceivable people are getting 15, 20x the RDA. Like, come on. Like, no wonder everybody's sick. 
And then, yeah, then they're fortifying, fortifying the food of it, and then they're genetically engineering foods to like rice to have to have more of it. And um, so this is the thing we have to realize: you don't have to believe that it is not a vitamin that it's a toxin to recognize that it is a toxin if you have enough of it. And we are having more than enough of it. And this is one of the things I said in my recent episode, Grants. Like, I don't know vitamin A is a toxin, but I I don't believe there's such a thing as vitamin A deficiency. I think by the time you've reached your twenties. You've had a lifetime supply. You don't ever have to have it again for the rest of your life. It's built up in your tissues. It's built up in your liver. It's built up in your fat stores. You've got plenty. Don't worry about ever running out. And so, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, thank you for adding that at the end. That was awesome. I had no idea about the uh, um, uh, about the seed oils and the high carotenoid content. So it's another great reason to avoid them. Okay. So for people who want to uh, learn more about your work, um, where should they go? Well, I have my blog, so ggeneru.blog. Uh, but maybe I'll just make a comment here is um, I'm now overwhelmed by email. And I, I've tried to answer everyone's email for the last you know, 10 years, but it's just getting overwhelming. I, I really can't keep up with it. And uh, so, you know, if people have questions, you know, post them on my forum or that, you know, just general questions. I'm, I, I'm, I don't do coaching or consulting you know i'm just a guy putting this message out there so uh, you know thank you for your interest but you know don't don't email general questions to me i just don't have the time to answer them anymore and to explain like grant is one of the few people in, you know I'm, I'm not in this category either who is not in the business of health he uh you know is a full-time engineer by trade that's what he does um and so um he's made zero dollars out of this i believe literally Zero. Zero. Okay. It's cost fact, me money. It's, I was going to say, cost me money. it must be a minus amount, right? Because it, it takes uh, money to maintain the website and all the rest of it. And of course, if you value your time, which everyone should, then as he said, he's put you know a tremendous amount of time, of course, writing books, as he said, replying to every personal email pretty much over the last 10 years. Um, the vast majority of information you are going to find in his books or in his blogs. And I 100% agree with that. Please don't email with uh, questions that show you that you if you've literally read every one of his books cover to cover and uh, all of his blog posts and scoured for his forums and you still don't have an answer, maybe then email him. But um, I think that would cut down your emails by like 99% probably. Go on. Perfect. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Now, yeah, let me qualify that. I, I do get emails of progress reports, what I call progress reports or testimonials. I do appreciate those. And I, I do get actually... Over the last few years, I've been getting about, on average, let's say about one a week. So I, I like getting those. Those are great. You know, it makes me feel like, okay, this is all worthwhile. So, you know, I'm, I'm fine with those uh, types of things. And I, have, I never share them with anybody. I just, you know, keep them to myself. So those are fine. But I, I, yeah, the general questions, I just don't have the time. Yeah. If he's, because he's probably already answered them, as I said, many times in those other places. Um, well, fantastic. Thank you so much for the work that you do, Grant. Um, I appreciate you being willing to be, what's the word, challenged here with a lot of questions. Um, but, you know, I'm a, I'm a huge believer in what you do. Uh, I, I am a huge admirer of the fact that you, uh, as I said, you're doing this, you know, for entirely selfless reasons. Um, you know, you obviously care. You could just work this out for yourself, healed yourself and being on your merry way, right? And and not dedicated so much energy to trying to help others. Uh, and yet you have. Thank you for that. And, you know, what really motivates me, yeah, sure, I've, I've recovered my own personal health, fine. But we are living in a very, very sick society. And, you know, if we don't turn this around, like in Canada right now, uh, the provincial budgets, it's about 45 to 50% of our government budgets are being spent on healthcare. So we have this, you know, socialized healthcare system in Canada. So about 50%, almost 50% of the government budget goes to quote healthcare. And it's, this is going to destroy our societies if we can't turn this chronic disease thing around. So that's what motivates me. My small part. That's why I don't talk about politics usually, but I'm very excited that any politician with any standing is starting to talk about, instead of arguing about how much we spend on healthcare that doesn't work, they're talking about what is the root of all these chronic diseases that is bankrupting every country? That's such a great question. And the fact that you have done this investigation into this very topic and come up with conclusions which are absolutely effective, as you say, not just for you, but for thousands of other people who've reached out to you, you can see them in the forums, you can see them in the comment sections on all kinds of other places. Probably underneath this video on YouTube, you'll see a bunch of comments saying how this system has profoundly changed someone's life. And 
Uh, by the way, if you're watching this on YouTube, make sure to add those comments if that's true for you. Um, you know, let people know, and I'm sure you know Grant would love to to see those. Uh, although he doesn't share your private success stories publicly, if you do post it publicly, I'm sure he'd love to see that as well. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much, Grant. I appreciate your time. I'll let you get to work. <laughs> okay, great. All right, see you. Hey, thanks for watching the video. If you enjoyed that, I recommend watching our latest episode, which you can do by clicking above. And make sure to subscribe, like the video, comment, and share with anyone who you think might appreciate it. Thank you.